Tonight, actor and writer Sujith Varaghese talks Kim's convenience, meeting Jim Henson, writing for Fraggles, the problem with Apu, and the surprising connection between Night Heat and a classic film. Hint, the connection is French. It's up all night with Bob. Hey now, thanks for staying up all night with Bob. And as I'm fond of saying during our special time together, please do hit that subscribe button. And while you're at it, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Folks, my guest tonight is an accomplished writer, director, and actor who in addition to his voluminous stage work has logged over 100 film and television appearances, including recurring roles on Suits, The Girlfriend Experience, Dick Grassy, Little Moss, The Border, and perhaps most famously as both Mr. Mehta on the Netflix and CBC sitcom Kim's Convenience and as Dr. Ajay Singh on the hit medical drama Transplant, about to enter its third season on CTV in Canada and NBC in the U.S. Please welcome to Up All Night with Bob, the one, the only, Sujith Varaghese. How are you, sir? Rob Sheridan, my God, what a what an intro. That's uh, three careers, one income, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> that's Canadian show business. Well, you um, know, like the, being in Canadian show business is like being in witness protection. Yeah. So I'm thrilled to be on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm thrilled to have you. Um, I think uh, uh, even uh, it is Canadian show business, but I think even folks who, who may not know your name I certainly know your face. You've been uh, a, a kind of a linchpin of uh, of a great many uh, a series and a number that I've worked on. I'm going to ask you this as my first question, because as we both know, when we were chatting just a little bit before the show, uh, uh, I worked, when I was uh, working on uh, writing on Little Mosque on the Prairie, you played Faisal, the uh, sort of a partner in crime to uh, Babur, played by our mutual friend, uh, Minaj uh, Sood. Uh, I wonder, though, if you remember the very first show that we worked on together. I thought Little Mosque was the very well, first. You'd, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But this um, is a trick question. It was very briefly, uh, but it was uh, one of the, my very first gigs in TV, which was uh, Howard Buskang's show, An American in Canada. Oh my God, the late lamented American in Canada, one of my favorite shows of all time. So much fun, and I was so delighted to get on there. And I was working with Steve Smith at the time, doing. I was also starting to contribute to the Red Green Show, and he said, "Why don't you go over and." talk to Howard and Howard and I hit it off. Um, and uh, anyway, I just did some punch up on the show. I, my, my role was very minimal, but you and I met a couple of times during some. Right. Some and stuff. It's uh, all you, you filtering back Af now. <laughs> yeah. So you played Afpab, who was the, uh, the, uh, the owner of the, of the donut show. What do you, what are your memories of that show? Uh, first of all, I, that was the first CBC sitcom. I was a, you know, a regular on. Right. So I was thrilled about that. Um, you know, the thing about uh, uh, Howard and that show was that it was it was a show that had a real great premise, and it was a premise you'd never seen before. It was so fresh. Um, I loved I loved being on that show. I loved the scripts. I loved the cast. Stuart and I are still close today. You know, he played the. Uh, second banana sidekick uh, anchor on the show. I mean, just so people know, you should tell them what the premise was, or I can tell them what the premise was. But it, it was about a, a, a an anchor, a TV anchor at, um, you know, an American TV anchor who is kind of uh, um, volatile, and he loses his job. And the only job his agent, played by Scott Thompson, can get him is as the morning show host for the third-rated TV station in Calgary, Canada. <laughs> so it's about the cultural differences between an American stuck in about as Canadian a place as you can be. And and you'd think, based on that premise, because we think Americans and Canadians are the same, you think, well, where's the funny in that? My God, it was so funny and so true and so accurate. Uh, I remember my favorite episode was one where the manager of the station um, is freaking out because his brother is going to get the Order of Canada, and his brother moved to LA 30 years ago, and wow. still is gets to get the Order of Canada. I mean, that is such a Canadian uh, story, you know. Um, so, so yeah, no, it was a great show. I'm really, I'm really glad you you brought it up. I agree with you, and I think it lasted. The two, two short seasons. Two short seasons. We, we only yeah. we 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 shot a, a pilot that won the Canadian equivalent of an Emmy Award. Um, <clears throat> and then we got six episodes for season one, and we got seven episodes for season two. And we were getting, you know, 
for the time and the fact that it wasn't promoted, fairly good ratings, like in the just under a million, 680,000 to a million, which yeah. back in those days was was more than you needed for a renewal. And yet yeah. the CBC pulled the plug after two seasons. So don't get me yeah. started with the CBC. Frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, frustrating. I wanted to ask you, this is an act, sort of an actor question and and also sort of a, a a cultural question. When you were playing Aftab, you 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 played the role with an accent, and I wanted to ask you about the sort of the accent wars over the years and how hard you've had to fight in them. Have you had roles where they've wanted you to kind of to do the accent and you 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 wanted to choose not to? And they, or I, I'd love I'd love to know your experience with that. Well, it's an interesting question. You know, my career um, <clears throat> has I would say. Until the last 10 years, I was sort of 50-50 on having to do an accent and having not to have to do one. Um, when I did American in Canada, the, the approach to my, my approach to accents is uh, uh, if the character speaks with an accent, then they should have an accent. It has nothing to do with whether I have an accent or not, any more than if the character is a surgeon I should be able to look like I'm doing surgery properly, right. but it doesn't mean I've been to medical school, right? Like it's yeah. it's a performance. Um, now we've reached a point in time politically where that's being called into question. Uh, you know, well, I don't know what to say about that. I think that um, the advantage of, of being able to do the accent as a performance means that you can apply a particular accent to a particular character. So an American, in Canada, Aftab was actually a very educated, cultural, cultured, specifically uh, tuned individual. And so I wanted his accent to be very, um, you know, sophisticated and and yeah. uh, upper class, so to speak, and educated. And, and uh, so I made that character choice in terms of doing that accent. When it got time to being cast on Little Mosque, that character was more working class. So the accent was more working class. Right. Um, and and the the advantage of hiring me to do to do it is that I can apply that spin depending on what accent, you know, what the character requires. Hiring an actor who naturally speaks with an accent because that's more authentic, I don't know if they can do that. You know, I mean, right. I don't know if there's a, it's a performance. It's not, you're not hiring a surgeon to play a surgeon. So, right. Uh, uh, that's my approach to accents is, is what is the character, you know, do they speak with an accent and then what kind of accent do they speak with? And finally, uh, are you able to do it authentically enough so that people who do speak with an accent don't call out that it's bullshit? Right. 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 So my, I, I don't answer to network executives on this. I don't answer to pundits. I don't answer to sociologists. I answer to the audience. Did you ever have the experience, <clears throat> pardon me, did you ever have the experience of auditioning and, you know, being encouraged to do one when you didn't want to do one? Or, I mean, I've heard this kind of story secondhand, but I, I just the curious uh, what your experience was. Well, if you, uh, not, by the time you get to the audition, you will have seen what the material was. And I have made the choice not to audition for, right. for something that is you know, clearly they're just looking to be, they're just clearly, they're, they're trying to be funny with an accent, right? They're, that's Where all the it is. The accent is the punchline as opposed to... It's a punchline. To... I mean, that you know, I, I'll pass on that stuff. That yeah, hasn't happened yeah. a lot in terms of TV. It's happened more in commercials. Like when I was auditioning for commercials, that would happen. I remember I went to, I went to a commercial audition years and years ago and uh, Russell Peters was there. Oh, yeah. So... So he goes in and he comes out and he's like, just, he's, he's sort of half mad, half steaming, half laughing. And he comes up and he says, Hey, go in there and, and, and don't do it with an accent. See what happens. See what happens. You know, and I'm going, don't mess with me, man. I want this job. Yeah, I, want job. I want this gig. <laughs> there was obviously, yeah, there's been, you know, we were talking about this in, an, in another uh, aspect of it just before we start tape, but uh, yeah, politically, you know, when you're looking at say like in in animated series, I mean we you know I was working I worked with uh, Hank Azaria last year on something and you know he he had really come after kind of obviously there was a lot of heat on him after the documentary the problem with that poo and I think his initial response was to be kind of defensive about that but by the time I was working with him uh, uh, close to a year later 
he had really come full circle and fell. I don't know, not that he, it wasn't that he, I mean, what was done was done in the show and, you know, it exists. But moving forward, he felt very adamant that that, that was absolutely the right thing to do, which was to, to retire the character or to have them revoiced by someone who was actually. Uh, well, it gets back to the issue of authenticity. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I appreciated what that that Apu character. I didn't have a problem with Apu as a character. Twenty five. How long has that show been on? Thirty years ago. 30, I was I was thrilled. I was thrilled that that a brown character was part of a mainstream animated show, right. and and I and I you know I think that was a, a a huge leap forward for people like me to see somebody like them that we all know and recognize. But yeah, he was an immigrant character. Now then the issue becomes. Uh, how how is that portrayed? And so they hire Hank Azaria to do it. His accent wasn't authentic. I mean, right. that was the problem for me right. was not the character, but the execution of the character. And as a result, I had a I had a you know split reaction to it because I I the character was great, the character was funny, the execution wasn't real enough for me to 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 get into the character anymore because I could hear this badly done accent happening right. and then i had to say well don't they hear that it's not correct and and are they trying to make fun of the guy doing an accent wrong like it became this meta conversation about right what are they really trying to do here right so yeah. so for me what i what they should have done was hire me 30 years ago to do that character <laughs> and we'd all be happy You were, of course, a writer on the original uh, Fraggle Rock. So I was. you were you were about twelve years old, obviously, because you know we're all well. Kids. Thank you. <laughs> but this was there. So this was in 85, 86. Are we start. No, no, eighty three. I, I, uh, the show started. Um, I think in the fall of eighty two was when they first started shooting it. I joined in uh, spring of eighty three. Oh, okay. And wow. It went on till uh, we did four seasons. Nineteen eighty-seven, we finished. This will never work. It has to. When we pretend to be Sir Hubris, the cords will leave forever. Now, now, just hold steady, Boomer. What else can I do? I'll get eaten by gorgs. Well, this doesn't work. Oh, well, thanks for the vote of confidence, Red. Now, hold steady. Hey. And Jim directed one of my episodes, and you know, I mean, it was the greatest experience of my life you know here was this genius taking what i had written and making a tv show you know like it wasn't it was it was just kind of wow isn't this this is really cool now i i would say that i was inside really intimidated but right. on on the outside i was just having the time of my life uh and jim you know because he was jim he got to get away with stuff that the other directors didn't so he was doing 30 takes and you know, all right. sorts of stuff. So it was having, it was great. Um, what was I mean, Jim. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry, go ahead. Well, I would say that Jim, you know, I don't even know if he knew who I was really. I mean, he knew I wrote the script, but I, I remember when I first met him, he was, he was very kind. You know, he would go around and he was meeting all the people who were new since he was there last because he was not there. All the time he'd come every two three months and right sort of make this an appearance shot right? up in toronto yeah it was shot in toronto but he would fly in from new york every two three months to do an episode or or whatever so he would meet all the people who'd been hired on since he was there the last time and he would go around the room and say oh this is joe so and so and this is frank you know hey joe how are you and he got to me and this is sujit he's one of our writers okay great <laughs> you know he just didn't want to risk saying the name wrong oh right right um uh, but he was a very, uh, I think he was really a, a, a very kind, somewhat shy guy. But I will say this, you knew that he was a hardcore, ruthless businessman. Like he didn't, that company didn't happen by accident. You know, he was an artist, but he surrounded himself with uh, people who really, you know, hardcore American TV producing types who didn't take no for an answer right and they had there were a couple of networks involved i guess there was well there was cbc well fraggle rock was the very first show that hbo ever commissioned well that's right it was on hbo yeah so yeah. Uh, it was a cbc henson co-production 
So CBC provided the facilities, they provided the crew, um, and Henson provided the money with HBO. So we would have to send the scripts to CBC and to HBO. Well, CBC was down the street, so they got couriered scripts in a taxi. Right. Uh, HBO, I remember uh, they were in L.A. We would have to uh, send the scripts by acoustic coupling modems, you know, the ones that the phone fits on the thing. And it... Oh, no way. Overnight, yeah. overnight, this was cutting edge technology. Yeah. It took yeah. all night to send a half hour script. What were the rules of that universe? Like, were there were there Fraggle rules? Were there things that that Muppets would do that Fraggles wouldn't? Or, I mean, they were all Muppets. But... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 show was very uh, clearly conceived. So so there was no Bible, but there was this big um, sort of coffee table brochure, coffee table book size brochure with drawings that Michael Frith, who had done, who did all the designs for for. Um, uh, the Fraggles, uh, I mean, the uh, the line drawings for Fraggles and Muppets and whatever. Uh, he would he illustrated this book and it is just explained the whole concept of the show in a way that um, made you want to watch it. So I, I came up with an idea for an episode and pitched Jerry Jewell, who was the head writer. And really, he was the third Muppet. He wrote everything Miss Piggy and Kermit ever said. And oh, is that right? um, yeah, no, he. Nobody knows Jerry, but Jerry, without Jerry, there would be no Muppets. There would be nothing. I wrote, there were 96 episodes. I wrote 10 of them. I wrote every single word of every draft of, of every episode that I wrote. There was no, you know, rewriting of anybody. I remember on one episode, and this is before computers, by the way, I was writing on a typewriter. Yeah. Uh, on my third episode, I finally got a computer after I'd written three episodes, the, I got an original IBM PC with oh, two wow. five and a quarter inch floppy drives, oh. a monochrome monitor, and 128K of RAM. <laughs> and no one's uh, ever gonna need more than that. No. Uh, and, but before that, I was strictly typewriter. I remember the third script I'd written. It was a doozer show. And doozers were very um, hard to shoot. That's the one time they were we were quite small with the little. They were the little, right? they were radio controlled. This is back oh. in '83. They were radio oh, controlled, so so um, they could walk, they could you know move, and and but it was radio controlled, but it was finicky, so they'd fall over or that you know, and there was a lot of monofill that you know if they had to raise their arm, there's a little tiny piece of monofill that's going up to the ceiling to raise their arm, and then there was a puppeteer off camera who had their hand in a mechanical radio controlled mouth that could manipulate, and then the the face on the on the doozer would move in sync with the with the oh wow doozer. and then the mic was around the puppeteer's head so right. they're off camera doing the doozer's mouth movements and head movements and voice and the little doozer which is about this this high is yeah. mimic mimicking that um but they were very finicky so i was doing this doozer script and and it wasn't going well and so finally i was given the shot listen you've got it's 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 if you don't get it right we're canceling this episode and it's not going to happen so i spent the weekend literally cutting and pasting all my drafts and you know i came back on monday morning with this you know it was like this thick you know <laughs> of, of lewd pieces of paper and handwritten shit in the margins and pieces scotch taped in and and i gave this thing to jerry jewel and he took it he looked at it and he took it into his office and I paced for 45 minutes in the outer office while I'm waiting for him to read it. And he he comes out of his office and he sees me there with, you know, literally white faced. And he chuckles and he reaches out his hand to me and he says, nice save. <laughs> and the show got made. <laughs> Switching gears just for a second, because you were also, you were also acting. Well, this is a little bit after that. Um, but I, I, I want to talk about one of your, your earliest on screen gigs, a show that people, a lot of people have probably forgotten at this point, uh, night heat, the oh, first yeah. while night heat, this was, you, you played, uh, did you play the same role in that show or were you, no, were you no, no, I played, time? I think I, I played a different character in every episode I was in. Thank you for coming. I didn't know what to do. I found, stop. You shouldn't have gone now. Oh, you must have the wrong plate. That one hasn't been off the lot. You sure about that? 
What's going on or Yo, Eddie, listen, man, we need to use the computer, okay? Are you crazy? I'd lose my job if anybody touched that. That's not a high-paying job. Do me a favor, we So this is one of the earliest, uh, really one of the earlier uh, big kind of big time kind of Canadian drama series. I think it aired for maybe four or five seasons. Four or five, five seasons on right? CBS. And on CBS, CBS too. Now, did it air on CBS primetime? Because I thought they picked it no, up. No, it was like called late CBS night Late Night. It was CBS right. Late Night. So it would come on after 1130, you know, like it was a it was basically the competition to The Tonight Show. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody watched it because everybody's watching The Tonight Show this with Johnny Carson. Days when, when Johnny Carson was it and there was there was nothing yeah. else. Uh, there were no other uh, uh, talk shows. But, you know, no. here's here's the great thing about Night Heat. Night Heat was uh, uh, created by Sonny Grosso. Now, if you saw The French Connection. Uh, you saw two cops trying to find the bad guys uh, in France. One of the yeah. cops was Popeye Doyle. His partner, played by Roy Scheider in the movie, was Sonny Grosso. And say, in real life, that's familiar to me. In real life, Sonny Grosso, after he stopped being a cop, became a TV producer and created Night Heat. And he came to Toronto and set up the show in Toronto. And uh, you and it was cast 99% of it was cast by local Toronto actors. And if you got cast on, if Sonny cast you once, you became part of his rep company. So he would have me. I, I remember I did my first episode at one line. Don Shabib, the great Canadian independent filmmaker, was directing and he was at my audition. And the, and I I read, you know, I did my one line and he liked it. So he cast me in this for one line. And after that, I never had to audition. Uh, the casting director, John Buchan, would just call me, say, you available to do an episode uh, next week? Uh, you're playing the taxi dispatcher. Or you're playing this. You're play And it was like a rep company uh, for, for Canadian actors, at the, the Toronto actors at the time. So I think I did, for Sonny, I must have done three night heats. I did a secret service. I did a... And, you know, he became, he, he was like this great um, imprimatur of Toronto actors. And he gave me my start. I mean, I I wouldn't have a career if I didn't have half a dozen Sonny Grosso credits. Well, let's talk about kids' convenience for a second. When I was a child, I could not even speak in public. Yeah. If I even look at my father, if I forgot to touch my grandmother's feet, swift cricket back to the backside. One time, I hold a 20-pound English Korea dictionary over my head outside in a heat wave. If I drop just a one centimeter, back. I think we raised our kids the right way, Mr. Kim. Yeah, I think so. So, how your daughter doing? She's not speaking to me anymore. I had auditioned for... Um, a character when the show was just about to start, who was a friend of of um, Appa, the uh, Paul Sun Young Lee character, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't get that part, so that was the end of that. And about halfway through season one, they called my agent and said, "There's this other character. We're going to show the network his original audition. If they like that, he'll play this character for one episode." which, you know, read between the lines there. They didn't even show the network my original audition, right? right? Now they're using my original audition to, to vet me for a different character. They call the next day and says, okay, they they passed that audition, so uh, he's going to play this character. So uh, I went in to rehearse with Paul. Now, the lucky thing was um, about six months earlier, Paul and I were in this low-budget Canadian movie. We each had one day uh, together. And it was outside and it was a big accident scene. And the action of the accident was what was being filmed. But I was the cause of the accident and he was the cop who was arresting me. Oh, so we were barely on camera in the background. So we improvised our own movie for our night just to keep ourselves amused. Mm -hmm. So we knew each other. And I go in for this rehearsal and, you know, I'd, we'd, we'd worked together for six months earlier and spent the night. We had some chemistry. And uh, after this half hour rehearsal, they called my agent and said, OK, we want to book him for two more episodes in season one. I get the scripts for those later two episodes. And I realize when I'm reading the scripts that the dialogue is the same as what I originally auditioned for at the beginning of the show. And so clearly what had happened was they'd cast somebody 
didn't work out. And then they transferred that character, this new character, Mr. Meta, and I played him for five seasons. Amazing. I, I will sometimes put it on on, on Netflix uh, uh, down here in L.A. just to kind of um, uh, feed a sort of a nostalgic urge for Tur for Toronto because, you well, know, no, I, no matter what city you go in, the convenience stores always look like that city to me. Do you know but, what I mean? But that, that's the thing. I When I first started watching the show and when I was on it, before it was on, well, as it was on TV, I said, you know, this is a great show, but nobody outside the 416 area code is going to watch this because it was such a love letter to Toronto. Mm -hmm. It's so specifically Toronto. The Korean convenience store, yes, they exist in other cities, but not they're not ubiquitous like they are in Toronto. So you don't have to explain it. It's sort of like the 7-Eleven uh, in, in um, uh, The Simpsons. You don't right. have to explain a 7-Eleven. Everybody knows what a 7-Eleven is yeah. and, and you can do it. Well, that's what that's what the Korean convenience store in Kim's is like. You don't have to explain it. You yeah. just are in it and it's there and everybody gets it. But what I didn't know was that people in Indonesia were going to get it. People in Australia were going to get it. People in Africa were going to get it. I get tweets from people all over the world, you know, how much they relate to the show. And yet it's so specifically Toronto. And that's a, that just proves the rule. The more specific you are, the more universal you are. Hey now, thanks for watching. Next time, part two with Sujith talking Transplant, Mission to Mars, a little movie made with Brian De Palma, some fun stories, lots of great stuff happening. Please do like and subscribe, tell your friends, comment, all that stuff. Good night, everybody.